FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's November 27th, 2017. Well, as you know, we were in San Francisco for the Gold Silver Summit. A lot of fun there, and we're back now. But gold uh, looks like it's trying to go up today. We'll just have to see what happens. And we're looking at interest rates, which also appear to be going up. Well, Anthony Sicaro who's president of Providence Financial, been on the show before, is with us now. Oh, before we get started, uh, I'm getting tons of your emails. I'm staying up to date on most of it. Keep it coming. Be part of the show. The email address is kl at kerrylutz.com. Twitter feeds at kerrylutz. And hey, so without further ado, Anthony, uh, welcome back. And rising interest rates, uh, what's going to be? Absolutely, Kerry. Thanks for having me back, and uh, happy post Thanksgiving to you. Um, you know, the interest rate environment is is really quite interesting because it, I think we're getting different signals across the board from both the government and the Feds in general. You know, the the, the media is reporting that the economy is really robust and doing great with some of the job numbers we've had and some of the expectation being you know being beaten. Um, you know, some of the numbers that we've had come out recently. It certainly looks like the economy is doing well. Um, and I'm a little concerned that that may not tell the whole story, though. There, there, I think there's actually still some problems ahead. And I think interest rates is really where the rubber meets the road. You know, the fact is that in a rising economy, in a great economy, the Fed Reserve should be able to raise interest rates pretty quickly. And we know that they've only raised them several times in the last two years. And it looks like they're going to raise them again in December by another quarter point. But we've had a full-blown recovery and they should be back in the 6% range or so like they were uh, before the crash in 08 and before the crash in 01. And they're not. I mean, we're in the 1% range at this point. So there's mixed signals for sure. And I think it's something to just keep an eye on. Yeah. So what of it? Uh, Supposedly, we have this robust economy. It does appear to be getting somewhat better when you look at it. Uh, But uh, what would happen if we had 6% uh, interest rates, uh, where would it head then? Yeah, well, certainly, uh, you know, the government doesn't want 6% interest rates. And that's the dilemma that they're caught in. You know, it, the rising interest rates verify how good an economy is doing. But the government is in a different position than it was last time there were 6% interest rates. Last time we were 6% interest rates was in 06, 07 ish before the 2008 crash. And last time we were at 6% interest rates, we were only $8 trillion in debt. Well, now all of a sudden they've added massive debt to the deficit, so we're approaching $20 trillion in debt. And Kerry, you and I both know that if uh, if you owe $20 trillion on a credit card, you don't want interest rates to be high. So yeah. out of one side of their mouth, they're saying the economy's doing great, uh, everything's going well, and we're going to raise interest rates. On the other side of their mouth, they really don't want rates to raise. That's the dilemma that's the trend. Every quarter point that the Federal Reserve raises interest rates costs another 50 billion dollars a year in interest yeah yeah very true so so what's a uh, central bank to do here uh now yellen is leaving powell is going to be replacing her is he going to be more accommodating well, I think he should be. I, I think that you need to separate the government from the Fed. The Feds were never supposed to have anything to do with the stock market. The, the Feds really have two two primary goals, and that is to keep inflation uh, at bay and to make sure that the economy is fully employed. Well, the economy has been fully employed for a long time, at least according to the unemployment numbers. And I think there's even an argument there that 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 would indicate when you when you look behind the scenes at the true unemployment numbers. I don't think 
think that's real. I think that's more of a facade than anything else. But according to the numbers that they've historically used and always used, we're at full unemployment. Well, the issue now is inflation. They've had a 2% target inflation for years, and they haven't been able to get to that, that 2% target. And and yet it's close enough to where I think they should have raised rates a long time ago. I think they need to quit fiddling with the economy, let the economy do what it's going to do. And you know if, it, if that means that it's going to crash, then it's going to crash um, by artificially inflating the the economy as they've done, I think they're just making, uh, postponing the inevitable, and I think the inevitable is just going to be worse than it was had they have let it run its normal course. Well, spoken like a true non-politician, Anthony, but there's political <laughs> considerations here, right? Uh, you have to, you know, there's a lot more to it than just... Uh, you know, what we think they should do. Like you said, uh, $20 trillion in debt. That's a lot of debt. Uh, what uh, what are they supposed to do here? They're caught in a box, aren't they? Well, yeah, but again, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be completely separate from the the government. Uh, the, the debt that, or, or the interest that the government has to pay on the debt really should have nothing to do with the Federal Reserve's decision. And yet, you can kind of tell that they're in bed together. You you know that the Federal Reserve and you know the government are communicating with each other. But I think what they need to do is act independently. I think that the Federal Reserve needs to take a look at what they need to do to raise interest rates at this point. And... Um, and and move forward accordingly without respect to the impact that it's going to have on the market and without the respect that the impact that it's going to have on the politicians' careers, uh, the political environment. That's never the Federal Reserve's role, uh, and I think they need to move on as if it was as if it's not their role, but that's not what they're doing. Yeah. What are the odds of that, Anthony? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, that, probably none. I mean, it's, you know, that's just the way it is. That's the way it's been for years. But, it, you know, but I think that needs to happen. Now, I, you know, I like some of the progress that's being made. They're starting to buy back some of these mortgage-backed securities, and they're starting to unwind their, you know, $4 trillion balance sheet. Um, they are going to raise interest rates again, but the reality is I think it's way too slow. Um, I think it's been way too slow over the years. And, you know, the market's got to have another crash. It, it, you know, nothing goes up forever. That's true with the market. Um, that's true with anything, as a matter of fact. So what goes up in the case of the market must come down. Now, the difference is, is that the last time the market recovered from, from, from 2009 really in 2013, during that rise, that, that recovery from the 60% crash that we had in 08 carry, um, you know, interest rates have not recovered with it. But if you go back to the tech bubble, the crash of 01, where the market was down 50% in 02 from 2000, two year, over a two-year time, 50% drop. Well, when the market recovered from 2002 to 2007, interest rates recovered with it. So that when the crash of 2008 happened, they could lower interest rates again because they had reloaded their gun. This time, they don't have any bullets in the gun. What, what are they going to do when the market crashes this time? Lower rates by 1% because that's all they got? Yeah. You know, they're out of ammunition at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, hey, I don't uh, envy them their position, but uh, that's what they're stuck with, and they have to do what they have to do here. But, uh, yeah, uh, the damage to the economy, I mean, it's their fault that the economy is all screwed up in the first place, right? I mean, let's face it. So just going cold turkey, well, you know, as a libertarian, to me, it's a very uh, attractive proposition. As a realistic matter, uh is there a better way of doing this? Well, that's the question. I mean, I think if there was a better way of doing it, I think the you know brainiac politicians would have figured it out. So I'm in, I'm going to say no, there really is not, uh, and it, and it's you know unfortunate, but we we really can't cry about spilled milk at this, milk at this point. I I think that over the last three or four years, as the economy has been recovering, they should have been raising interest rates um, at a, at a higher level and. They haven't done that. So now they're in this position where I think they should continue to raise interest rates as we go. And, you know, if the economy, Carrie, is doing as well as they want us to believe in all these numbers, and we had we had new housing start numbers that just came out recently that were you know, big numbers. Um, but the bottom line is, if the economy is doing as well, then a quarter point shouldn't hurt anything. And if we're worried about raising rates a quarter point, then, then we have to ask ourselves, is, you know, is, are, are they acting slow? Or is it that there's something that we're not being told that, you know, that, that the economy maybe isn't doing as well as we're led to believe? Mm-hmm. 
So you think that's the case, uh, that the economy really is in worse shape than they want to admit? And that's why we're kind of like uh, paralyzed here by fear? I think that I think that's part of it. I mean, I think there's a number of illusions that are going on in the economy to start with. Um, you know, last year and the year before, we're back to back record years for stock buybacks. And what that means is that because interest rates are so low, companies will go out and they'll borrow money on bonds because rates are at, at historic lows, and then they'll use that money to buy back their own stock. And and of course, when you buy stock, the the demand for stock goes up and the price goes up. So while it looks like the price of their stock is going up, uh, and while their earnings per share uh, are going up because they're mm -hmm. buying back their own stock, the reality is, is they've not brought in one additional dollar of revenue. That's, that's an illusion. That's like a magician making it look like the company is doing a lot better than it really is doing by, by manipulating the stock price. And this is going on with many different, you know, many different companies a, across the country. And then you look at unemployment. I alluded to that a little bit earlier. Well, they, you know, unemployment now is hovering around 4%. And, and yet the reality is it doesn't include – Certain things. It doesn't include people yeah, who have yeah. been on unemployment for six months. Uh, you know, take them off. Uh, they, they still don't have a job, but it doesn't include those people. It does include the millennials that can't get a job. It doesn't include the seniors that really want to work but can't get a job. So when you throw in the underemployed and, and the unemployed, I mean, we're we're at double digits still, and. You no, know, the reality is, is I, I think that the, the four percent in, in illusion. And here's where I think, Carrie, if you're going to wrap it up in one, you know, one kind of a conclusion. Right now, we have one out of seven people in the country on food stamps. And if you look at all the other government assistance programs out there, whether it's the Medi-Cal or Medicaid across the country, whether you look at uh, you know, uh, utility bill discounts and other governmental programs, you realize right now there are 110 million people. One out of three people right now in the United States of America is on some sort of government assistance program. Does that sound like a healthy economy, the best economy we've ever been in? Doesn't it just sound healthy something to me. <laughs> Yeah, something something's wrong. Yeah, it definitely doesn't sound healthy, for sure. Uh, but uh, things are getting better. I mean, the housing starts today uh, came up, and they were the best in 10 years. It's kind of hard to fake housing starts, isn't it? Well, I, I think so, but I think you know, that sales? may be a part of the wealth effect. Um, you know, when, when people feel good about things, people feel good about the economy, and they go out and spend money. And unfortunately, I think we might be getting back into where we were in 2007. It almost feels like 2007 all over again. And, you know, you and I both remember that time where oh God, yeah. everyone felt like we feel today. All the numbers were good in 2007 like they are today. And then all of a sudden, everything everything crashed. And unfortunately, I think, that, I think that's where we are. And, you know, I think that this economy is, I think we're in a new economy. I don't think we're in a low interest rate environment anymore, Carrie. I actually think we're in a new interest rate and a new low inflationary environment for one reason, and that is because of the baby boomers. You know, in, in, the, in the 80s and 90s when the market was, when we had the best market that this country has ever, ever seen, especially in the 90s, well, the baby boomers were in their prime, right? They were 30 to 50 years old at that point, spending all the money, and then you throw some, you throw some technology in with that, and it was just a prime market. It for for straight up growth, and that's what happened. But now those baby boomers are 50, 70 years old. They're starting to slow down. The older they get, they're gonna they're gonna slow down even more. They're starting to spend less. They're starting to you know get out of debt, pay off the credit cards that they ran up during the 80s and 90s, and you know since then. And the reality is 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 you know this this generation, a generation four times larger than any other generation in the country and history, other than the millennials that can't get jobs. But this generation is driving the economy. And and I think it's going to be slow for a long time to come as they get older. Interesting. Well, you could very well be correct here, Anthony. So what is uh, somebody supposed to do? Buy Bitcoin? Yeah, no, I, I definitely wouldn't be buying Bitcoin unless you just were a gambler and a, and a speculator. Um, you know, I think Bitcoin has some issues ahead. I, you know, it's certainly extremely volatile, and I, I wouldn't recommend that for anyone unless they just had some money they wanted to play with and willing to take a gamble. You know, it, you know, you put money into Bitcoin, and it could be something that in a short period of time or a long period of time is just gone. Uh, you know, loss of massive, you know, massive, massive uh, net worth, or it could be another Apple that ten years from now you're be glad you did that. I, I I tend to think that in a decade, anyone that has Bitcoin now is going to be happy with it, but it's extremely speculative.
speculative. I would not recommend buying that again, unless you're a gambler and you want to gamble with some money. Yeah. Um, but what do I think they should do? You know, I, I think I think they you know where the height of the market. Now. I think they should reevaluate their position. I think they should ask themselves: Should I even be in the market at this point, knowing that the market's at record levels, or should I you know protect my money? There, there's a whole universe of options out there that are really not stock market related that are designed to pay somewhere between four and seven percent rate of return, just you know interest and dividends consistently and persistently. Uh, different flavors of bonds and preferred stocks and business development corporations and REITs, uh, some annuities out there. You know, the reality is there's a whole lot of investments that are designed to protect your principal, but still pay you a decent rate of return. And that's why I have a lot of my clients, most of my clients I would say, until a better time to get back in the stock market. So I wouldn't say never stock market, but I think not stock market, you know, while it's at its high. The old stock market has buy low, sell high, right? Yeah. Right now we're at record high. It's not time to be buying. Yeah, for sure. Time to be taking profits and right. keeping some powder dry so that you'll be able to uh, uh, live to fight another battle, if you will. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly right. You know, and you, you think about the last year, I mean, the market up 28 you know percent or so in the last year and over, you know, from 2009 to now, the market up well over 300 percent. You know, if, if you've been in the market this whole time, congratulations. You know, essentially, you sat down at the Wall Street casino, you put in a quarter and you won some money. You won 500 bucks. And if it's just like any other casino, if you put in a quarter and win 500 bucks, what's your very next move supposed to be? <laughs> yeah, like right? Cash You're out. Supposed to that's right. That's right. And that's, I think that might be where we are. So I wouldn't change what you've done if you've been in the stock market, but I think I would really consider whether, whether you want to remain sitting at that casino, giving it all back. Cause that's probably what's going to happen. And that happens all too often, both in the wall street casino and in the uh, gambling denizens across the world. Uh, I don't know if your odds are better, uh, better at the <laughs> wall street casino or not, but that casino can turn on you really quickly. So Hey, uh, Anthony, just tell us uh, where we find you, how we find out more about you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my website is probably the best place. It's uh, ProvidenceFinancialInc.com. Again, my, my firm is Providence Financial. We're located in Woodland Hills, California. It's Los Angeles, California. And the website is ProvidenceFinancialInc.com. And anyone that's listening to your show that has any questions, want to schedule a quick you know, review with me, a quick phone call, I'm more than happy to do that. They can you know, contact us through our website, ProvidenceFinancialInc.com. All right. And we'll have a link to it in the show notes of this interview on Financial Survival network.com as i said join the show send us an email uh we've got a lot of great questions in the queue that we're going to be coming up with and hey while you're at it uh, take a look at the twitter feed that's at carrie lutz and the facebook page is financial survival network anthony thanks so much for coming on carrie it's been a pleasure thank you and look forward to doing it again FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.